The 40-year-old U.S. flag steam-powered cargo ship El Faro was owned by Tote Maritime Puerto Rico and operated by Tote Services Incorporated. The vessel was engaged in weekly service between Jacksonville, Florida and San Juan, Puerto Rico and typically followed a course traveling to the east of the Bahama Islands. The vessel sank on October 1, 2015 in Hurricane Joaquin, a Category 3 hurricane. At 9.48 Eastern Daylight Time on the evening of September 29th, El Faro departed Jacksonville loaded with containers and vehicles. The ship was bound for San Juan with a crew of 33. Two days before El Faro left on the accident voyage, the storm that became Hurricane Joaquin was a tropical depression about 360 nautical miles northeast of San Salvador Island, Bahamas. The system was upgraded to Tropical Storm Joaquin at 10.36 the evening of September 28th. Hurricane Joaquin was consistently predicted to move southwest then turn north, but the storm continued to move in a more southerly direction. Its intensity grew to a higher level and faster than predicted. On August 8, 2016, about 10 months after the vessel sank, El Faro's Voyage Data Recorder, or VDR, was recovered it lay under more than 15,000 feet of water. The VDR recorded the last 26 hours of conversation on the bridge as well as vessel operating data. The VDR recording began at 5.36 in the morning on September 30th. The vessel was traveling at about 20 knots. Just after 6 a.m. on September 30th, a Bond Voyage system or BVS weather package was downloaded on a computer in the captain's office. The BVS weather package had been sent about one hour earlier. BVS is a desktop application provided by a private company, Applied Weather Technology. The BVS package showed the predicted storm track, weather, and sea state information in graphic form. BVS tropical cyclone position and intensity information sent to El Faro during the accident voyage was typically six hours behind the current National Hurricane Center information. According to the BVS package sent at 5 a.m., storm winds were 55 knots sustained. Aboard El Faro, BVS weather packages were sent only to the captain's email address, but he could forward them to a computer on the bridge where the information would have been available to other crew members. After reviewing the 5 a.m. BVS weather information with the chief mate, the captain ordered a course change of 10 degrees to the south to put distance between the ship and the approaching storm. About 15 minutes later, El Faro received the National Hurricane Center storm advisory on the SAT-C printer on the bridge. This unscheduled advisory contained a minor correction to the normally scheduled advisory that had been sent about two hours before. SAT-C is an automated satellite system that transmits weather advisories to vessels of all types. SAT-C data is only provided in a text format. This report indicated similar intensities to the 5 a.m. BVS package. Sustained winds were 60 knots, gusting to 75 knots. Throughout this presentation, the position of the storm will be interpolated along each predicted BVS or SAT-C track in order to show where the storm would have been expected to be at any specific time. The position of the storm along the National Hurricane Center's best track, or actual track, will be shown in black. This storm track was calculated after the accident. The National Hurricane Center identified the storm as a hurricane at 7.39 a.m. on September 30th. It was then centered about 135 nautical miles east-northeast of San Salvador Island. During the noon to four watch on September 30th, the VDR recorded Coast Guard aircraft broadcasting two warnings to mariners about the hurricane. Later that afternoon, after hearing several discussions about the weather, the helmsman asked the captain if he was going to turn around. The captain said no. Just before 5 p.m., the ship received a SAT-C weather report that sustained winds had increased to 75 knots, gusting to 90 knots. The BVS weather package sent to the captain's email address at 5 p.m. and downloaded about an hour later showed slightly less intense conditions. About 7 p.m., the captain ordered a course change of 10 degrees farther to the south to put more distance between the ship and the storm. The vessel's track would shift to pass between San Salvador Island and Rum Key and then turned to pass to the north of Samanaki. After 7.57 p.m. on September 30th, the captain left the bridge and was not heard again on the VDR recording until 4.09 the next morning. Just before 11 p.m., the bridge received a SAT-C advisory 
that the storm's sustained winds were 100 knots, gusting to 120 knots. Joaquin was now a Category 3 hurricane. At 11 p.m., a BVS weather package was sent to the captain's computer. It was not downloaded until 4.45 the next morning. After reviewing the updated sat Sea weather report at 11 p.m., the third mate called the captain. He told the captain that on its current track, the vessel would meet the storm at 4 o'clock the next morning. The VDR only recorded audio from the bridge and did not capture the captain's side of the conversation. About 10 minutes later, the third mate called the captain back and said they would be 22 miles from the center of the storm at 4 a.m. and suggested altering their course to head south at 2 a.m. However, this suggested course change was not implemented. At the midnight watch turnover, the third mate told the second mate that they were receiving different information from different weather sources. The second mate reviewed the weather forecast and began looking at the charts for a course to avoid the storm. At 1.20 a.m. on October 1st, after hearing a satellite radio report that the storm was strengthening, the second mate called the captain and suggested a course change at 2 a.m. toward Old Bahama Channel, which runs north of Cuba. The captain did not agree with the second mate's suggestion. The second mate said the captain's orders were to run with the original course. This course put them directly into the forecasted path of the hurricane. Throughout the second mate's midnight to four watch, the weather deteriorated rapidly. The ship began listing to starboard because of the strong winds on the port side, and the vessel was losing speed as it approached the outer bands of the storm. Due to the starboard list and worsening conditions, seawater entered into the partially enclosed second deck of the cargo area through cargo loading and other openings in the hull. Toward the end of the watch, the vessel was unable to maintain its heading using the autopilot system because of the wind and the high seas. At 4.09 a.m., the captain returned to the bridge. He and the crew talked about the weather and the loss of ship speed. Despite the worsening weather, the captain said several times that they would be ahead of the storm. He thought they were on the better side of it, meaning the less dangerous quadrant. The captain was most likely relying on the BVS graphical weather package sent at 5 p.m. the evening before. He had not downloaded the most recent BVS package. Statements on the bridge indicated that the ship was listening to the starboard side, due in part to the strengthening winds on the port side. About 4.40 a.m., the chief engineer called the bridge and said the starboard list was affecting the oil levels in the sumps of engine room machinery. At 4.45 a.m., the captain downloaded the BVS weather package that had been sent about 11 o'clock the night before. By the time the captain downloaded it, the storm's position and intensity data in the BVS package were 12 hours behind the National Hurricane Center's current information. About the same time, a National Hurricane Center advisory arrived on the bridge via sat -C. The hurricane was centered about 17 nautical miles north of Samana Key. Maximum sustained winds were 105 knots, gusting to 130 knots. The chief mate mentioned a list of possibly 18 degrees, while the captain discussed how oil levels in the engine room were affected by the list with the engineer who was aboard to supervise the riding gang. At 5.43, the bridge received a phone call that there was water in the number three cargo hold. The crew thought that the water was possibly coming from a small open hatch called a scuttle on the second deck. A minute later, the captain said cars were loose. He was likely referring to cars in the lower level of the number three cargo hold. The captain verified that bilge pumps were running to remove the water in three hold, and he directed the engineers to pump ballast water from a starboard to a port tank to improve the list. The captain and chief engineer spoke on the phone about the water level rising in the cargo hold and the effects of the list. After speaking to the chief engineer, the captain ordered the ship to be turned to port to put the wind on the starboard side of the vessel and create a port list. As the ship was turned to port, the chief mate reported that the hold was flooded on the starboard side. Within two minutes, the ship's significant starboard list shifted to a significant port list. After the ship was listing to the port side, the captain ordered the engineers to stop transferring ballast. The chief mate accessed a scuttle, reporting that water had been knee-deep and pouring over the scuttle, and then closed it. After the turn to port, the crew on the bridge noticed that the ship was losing speed. Shortly after 6 a.m., El Faro lost propulsion and the vessel could no longer maneuver. At 7.06 a.m., the captain spoke with Tote's designated person to advise him of the situation. He reported that there was a considerable amount of water in three-hold, 
They had lost propulsion due to a loss of lube oil pressure. The list was about 15 degrees, and the weather was ferocious. Afterwards, the captain told the second mate to send a distress message. At 7.15 a.m., the chief mate reported that the chief engineer said a fire main was ruptured, likely meaning that there was a damaged seawater pipe in three-hold, allowing seawater to rush into the cargo hold. The chief mate reported that cars were floating in the number three cargo hold, and a bilge alarm alerted the crew that water began entering another cargo hold. Although the crew had closed the scuttle and were pumping out the space, water was still entering the cargo hold faster than the bilge pumps could remove it. At 7.27 a.m., the captain ordered the emergency signal to be sounded over the general alarm system, and two minutes later, the captain ordered the abandoned ship signal to be sounded. The VDR recording ended at 7.39 a.m., while the captain tried to help the helmsman escape the ship's bridge.